Good afternoon, and uh, coming to you now from the um, Fellowship of St. Alban and St. Sergius uh, here in British Columbia, the British Columbia chapter, and my uh, co-moderator of the uh, the chapter, Ron Dart, as many of you know, is a considerable scholar, and particularly in the field of, of uh, religious and political literature, and of course political science. And uh, he's brought along a book, which I haven't read yet, called The Naked Anabaptist, The Bare Essentials of a Radical Faith, by Stuart Murray. And uh, we've asked Ron to tell us, since he's read the book and gone through it carefully, to give us a review of it and give us some of his points of view and opinion about it. Um, some of you might have stumbled across the book and some of you might find it interesting, but I think it'll be nice to have... Uh, to have uh, Professor Dart give us his views of the book and, and something of a, re a review of it. Uh, Ron, what is this book all about? Well, first of all, probably the uh, initial point to notice is that Stuart Murray sees himself as a part of, in the community in um, England, as a part of a neo-Anabaptist movement. And what do we mean by that? Uh, I think the, the initial perspective is here is that in the 16th century there was the emergence of the Anabaptist uh, community. It was a diverse community, but they came as strong critics of the what we would call the magisterial reformers, the Lutheran tradition, the Reformed tradition, and they were very critical of the Roman Catholic tradition as well. And they saw themselves more than any other form of Christianity in the 16th century as getting back to the pure faith of the New Testament. Uh, they argued that the Roman Catholics had essentially assimilated, assimilated to power and um, service of the state. The magisterial reformers in that sense were no different. So Lutheran and Lutheranism in the state. And you had John Calvin in Geneva and you had the... Zurich Reformation under Zwingli, church and state still worked very, very closely together, and the state was willing to use uh, violence in service of the church to bring order in cities or the states. Now, the Anabaptists, starting from the uh, Beatitudes, Sermon on the Mount, argued that if you're going to be true ethically to the faith, just not confessionally or theologically, you have to love your enemy, pacifism is the way to go, communalism is an option also, and so the naked Anabaptist is not about literally people wandering around naked, it's an attempt to get back to the core or the essentials of what they see as first generation Anabaptist ethics uh, in terms of life practiced and lived in a sacrificial manner that echoes and reflects what they would argue is authentic New Testament Christianity. Mm -hmm. So in a sense the Anabaptist first of all comes as a critique of what they would argue that many Mennonites have pretty well assimilated into the broader culture and if there's going to be a revival of uh, this Mennonite tradition they have to get back to the vision of the first generation Anabaptists. Now the second point that comes out of that is the question of well, whose version of first generation Anabaptism. Stuart Murray um, does an extended chapter in looking at in fact the huge diversity in 16th century Anabaptism from the violence of Munster on one hand to the pacifism of certain and the separatist tendencies of certain Anabaptists to everything in between. So so that when you talk about getting back to the core essentials of, of the Anabaptists, that raises the question, well, whose version of the core essentials? Mm -hmm. And so there's some, there's some difficulties in the book in terms of articulating what those core essentials are, when if in the origi origins of Anabaptists, there was not a core. Um, I would say the more disturbing part of the book from someone who comes from a mother church tradition or historic church tradition is that what Stuart Murray argues is that there was this pure New Testament tradition that followed Jesus practically in a, a way uh, that as the church developed historically there was a dimming of that fire. And through the first century or two you had a genuine faith in which there were true followers of Jesus who faced martyrdom, who faced persecution, as did Jesus, as did John the Baptist. Uh, but by the time Constantine came to power, and Eusebius's famous oration speech, the church uh, increasingly assimilated to power the wealth, the property, the possessions, 
and really became um, a servant of the state. Now this is a sort of a typical sort of Anabaptist read of church history, that you have this pure New Testament, it lingered for a couple of centuries, Constantine makes the church the official uh, religion of the empire, and the church assimilated to that. And then, of course, the church descended increasingly into darkness uh, throughout the Middle Ages. Now, uh, the An naked Anabaptist doesn't deal with the Orthodox tradition, it's primarily Western. But then, with the Reformation, you get sort of almost up from the grave, uh, arose the Anabaptists, and they were the ones who took us back to pure Christianity. Um, this very much distorts sort of the patristic heritage, right. because you never get any of the fathers of the East or West who genuflected to the emperor. They always lived in prophetic tension with the state. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I wonder how t many times when they look back at the sort of pristine church, if they really do that much careful historical reading about how not quite so pristine it was and about how the, the, and the tensions and the struggles within the first century church, uh, or even realize the need to, to finally determine what is orthodoxy and what is not and to separate the Gnosticism and Gnostic ideas from the, uh, um, what, what they would like to call the pristine gospel church. Uh, it wasn't nearly so clear-cut in the early first centuries. No, and you had tensions between Peter and Paul, and you had clashes amongst the you know early disciples, and so... And Martianism and uh, uh, all of the other, uh, Simeonism, and uh, so many other movements and stresses that, that without Constantine could never have been resolved. Yeah, and so it's, I mean, it's, it's very, very much an idealism and an idealizing of that first uh, few centuries and then a total buying into the Constantinian fall thesis. Mm -hmm. And of course people like uh, Stuart Murray prey on the um, historically illiterate in our mm -hmm. time yeah. in which amnesia is dominant, so if you sort of argue, well, that that's what the early church did or the patristic area, well, I guess this de facto that's what they did, because if a person is not steeped mm -hmm. in history, then it's Orwell says if a person, you know, has no sense of history, you can manipulate their mind like silly putty yeah, and make yes, them think yes. anything they want. Mm -hmm. And so we have a whole generation of people that mm -hmm. are disaffected from sort of the Protestant tradition. Um, they're longing for something what they think is authentic. So if you sort of say the, the modern church, like the patristic era, compromised, uh, it distorted, mm -hmm. but if we just get back to that first century, it also facilitates sort of a further fragmentation of the church. Mm -hmm. And so this really plays into what we would see today called the postmodern emerging church mm -hmm. tradition, that this is the pure remnant, the 16th century Anabaptists were the pure remnant, mm -hmm. first century church was pure remnant, so you make this uh, jump and then everything else which is not a part of that is compromised, mm -hmm. it's assimilated, it worships Caesar, so mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of a comic book version mm -hmm. of church history. Yeah, yeah. I think that's one of the critical things that we might um, be trying to overcome somehow in, in the uh, fellowship, uh, or through the fellowship is give people a greater sense of the actual history of the church and the, the, the idea that there was always a golden age someplace in the past. And there was never a golden age in the past, especially not before antibiotics and, uh, uh, and before proper sanitation, you know, and a few things like that. But the idea that there was somehow a uh, religious or spiritual um, golden age where you didn't have all the stresses and tensions and disputes and all of that, never existed. Not even from the first moment that it exists. And it's been con constant throughout. So it, it, the um, lack of knowledge of, of the history of the first century itself of Christianity is already the thing that opens people up to any kind of demagogic manipulation about the ancient church or any kind of fantasies about the ancient church. And um, it's perhaps better if people do have a, more of an understanding and knowledge about that. And you know, I think the dilemma too, like the subtitle is Radical Faith. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think part of the dilemma of this, you'll get many Protestants who will, let's say, get back to the Bible as a source of the faith, or to Jesus, or openness mm -hmm. to the Holy Spirit, and they call this 
radical faith. The irony is that many of these people who claim to be this are further dividing the church. Mm -hmm. And so, to me, there's nothing radical about that. In fact, it is a full assimilation into the fragmentary nature of modernity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, the, the irony is, is that they use these loaded terms as a code word into furthering divided, dividing the church. And to me, real radical is getting back to the unity of the body of Christ and what we're meant to be as one is the body of Christ. And so, the very language which is used, um, is the, the, the meanings put into it is the very opposite. Mm -hmm. So radical and getting to the roots is about our unity, mm -hmm. uh, which the historic church in its best is trying to get towards. Yeah. Uh, but post-Protestantism, you just get fragment upon fragment upon fragment. And so because of this negative view in the naked Anabaptist towards the historic church, the language of peace, which Stuart Murray uses a lot in Justice, it further facilitates discord, and so it doesn't bring about peace. Yeah. Well, yeah, the, um, the um, newspeak of propaganda is always um, divisive. And it also leaves us with no framework for communications because they've already taken a vocabulary and reshaped it into this newspeak. In other words, it's, it's a propaganda vocabulary. Consequently, what they say means they can use the same words, but they've already predetermined what kind of meaning they're going to have, and it isn't necessarily what the word actually means. And uh, consequently, it makes even dialogue very difficult, because we use the same words, but we say something quite different with them. I often use that when my students at school all say, well, I'm going to London tomorrow, and they automatically think of London, England. Mm -hmm. Of course, I could be flying to London, Ontario. Yeah. So same words, but yeah. where the plane lands is a totally yeah. different destination. Yeah.